Hey, what is going on, everybody? It is Aaron Trevino, and we have a terrific guest here. We have Shrada Jenkins from here in beautiful Austin, Texas. How you doing, Shrada? I'm good. How are you? Great, great. I know we've been talking for a while, so it's great to see you, and I'm really glad we could we could make this happen. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm excited that you reached out to me. I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk to your audience. Yeah, absolutely, because I, I know that we had kind of We'd spoken um, earlier this spring. You had a few, you know, projects you were working on. Um, I do know that you work um, on, on quite a few real estate deals, so I was definitely interested to 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 talk to you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what do you want to know? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, just um, just kind of wanted to hear uh, more about you. I mean, for those of us who don't know, um, could you introduce yourself? For sure. Um, so my name's Shrada. You already got that part covered. Um, my husband and I have been married, uh, almost a year and between the two of us, we have three kiddos. So, um, the oldest is my daughter river, who's 13. Um, his son who's eight, his name's Michael. And then the little one who is six, Julia. Um, and we sort of joined forces in this real estate thing. So we kind of came at it from different perspectives, um, but wanted similar things and, the last year and a half or so has just been um, absolutely insane. So it has not stopped. Um, we seem to only know one speed, which is fast. And so that's, you know, at times it's chaotic and overwhelming. And at other times you can, you get to see the progress on a daily basis. You know, we've learned things, we've learned terms and expressions and ways to analyze things in the last year that we didn't even know exist existed prior to that. So um, it's definitely been a huge um, learning experience. Absolutely. So I know you mentioned how it's kind of been a bit hectic, a bit crazy. You know, what, what all, you know, has that been mostly with, you know, your deals or what exactly has been kind of hectic? Um, well, so I would say for us, life is kind of hectic, you know, just like most people, well, pretty much everyone, the pandemic has impacted the way that we do life. Um, having kids at home and virtual schooling and everything else, that's definitely changed things. Uh, it's also created an opportunity, if you will, in that there's not everyone's looking at real estate right now. Not everyone's re ready and willing and able to invest. And so we're definitely um, on the different side, on a different side of that. And so that's opened us to new opportunities. Uh, and then definitely deal wise. So we've bought more properties um, in the last year than in the rest of our lives combined. <laughs> and so it's just been sort of like this massive catalyst. Um, so we're closing on properties and doing rehabs and refinancing or moving tenants in, all these kinds of things. And it's just all at breakneck speed, depending on the day. Sure, absolutely. Now, I'm just a bit curious as well, you know, did you know from a younger age that you wanted to always do real estate or kind of how were you able to get into the industry? Um, so I thought real estate was interesting and definitely in my early twenties, I started to look at it as to like, Oh, I, I had a friend who was a flipper and I thought, you know, regular people can do that. It's not just on TV, if you will. Um, Cause you know, you think HGTV and that's not, uh, it sounds too good to be true if you will. So I kind of had this introduction and I personally have always loved construction. Uh, I work for a general contractor actually still today. And so construction to me is fascinating because you get to make something new or build something fresh. Um, and so that got my attention and it just kind of got my wheels turning. And it's been sort of a slow progression since then um, up until the last year, year and a half or whatnot, which is just definitely the the gears have shifted and everything's moving quick it's kind of like everyone says once you do that first deal everything else starts to fall into place you know and for us that was definitely true so it took me years of networking and shaking hands and learning and all of that before i was ready to tackle my first rehab um, and to buy my first investment property even though i had deals under contract before that hadn't worked out like all the things um it took a while for me to get to that place. And then once I got there, it was just like dominoes and they just started falling and they just keep going. So. Yeah, no, I'm, you know, I'm really interested in this because it seems like a few different people kind of have that story of, Oh, you had a few deals under contract. They didn't work out. 
um, and then kind of how you said things fall into place. Um, do you think it's more of a confidence you developed or some sort of shift in your mindset? What, wh why do you think that is? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think there's definitely some level of competency. So I just like, so I, I go to Aria, you know, that was one of the things where I met a lot of people um, and built that network, which, you know, it sounds cheesy, but like your, your network equals your net worth, that whole thing. Uh, so I started building those connections and just like they tell you at most of the Rias, like I started doing my, my own direct marketing, writing my own letters for a while. I was handwriting my own letters and then hired those out and all those things. And so I had some leads come in from those and I recognized that I wouldn't know what I was doing on my own. So I reached out for partners and in those scenarios, we got them under contract. And then as we just started to do all of our due diligence things, either the comps weren't what they appeared to be initially or things were gonna cost more and we just weren't able to offer the seller something that was gonna be fair. Um, and so we had to walk away from those as difficult as that was. Um, it's definitely part of the journey that a lot of people don't wanna talk about. So um, you have those, in my case, they felt like struggles, challenges, failures, whatever, um, but they did, open my eyes to how someone with more experience would look at a property and what the options might be and what their methods for pricing or for renovations would be, you know, where they would do an extensive renovation and where they would do something minor. And I think all of that um, knowledge sort of compiled to a point where I felt confident enough to go after something on my own. Absolutely. You know, you touched on something pretty interesting there. You talked about um, you know, the comps not coming out right, or you talked about, you know, maybe your rehab costs ended up being much higher than you expected. Um, could you kind of maybe elaborate a bit more on that? Sure. So um, I live in, Austin, in the Austin area. Uh, I live in North Austin. So one of the little towns that I love is Round Rock. So my very first lead that came in from my direct marketing was this historic town, historic house in Round Rock. And I could not have been more ecstatic. Um, and I had, by networking, I had met um, a gentleman who preferred those older homes. I knew that was like his bread and butter. He knew what to do with them, just the whole shebang. And so I reached out to him um, and we looked through some of the comps. I didn't have just like a lot of new investors. I didn't have direct MLS access at that point in time. So we used like, I think Listing Spark. They had kind of started to build um, their own way of pulling comps and so we'd looked through there when we'd done some some other researching around if you will and so we felt like there was a really good margin on this um, we got it under contract I took him with me we looked at the work like which I, I would say to a new investor that would be my biggest recommendation is to bring in somebody because you don't know what you don't know you know yeah. um, so brought him in and as we were looking at it we realized that most of what we were expecting for our ARV was based upon one comp because it being historic and just in that area, um, it's challenging. You don't have a lot of home sales there. So it's hard to compile that data and to know what an appraiser is gonna look at for your ARV. And then we dug into that one comp and it just seemed like it was someone who had overpaid for a house. Um, they weren't an investor. They were just gonna kind of do some work and repairs themselves. And so it just made us feel like we were going to be putting a lot of eggs into a basket that may or may not be able to hold them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a great way to explain it. Um, because me personally, I'm not very well versed on historic homes. Um, you know, that's something very nuanced and you obviously need someone who's, you know, pretty experienced with that particular type of home, right? Yes. Yeah, for sure. And um, I think a lot of what, you know, whenever we're trying to figure out what something's going to be worth after it's fixed up, we're going to be looking at the comps and we, we have to be able to imagine what an appraiser is going to look at. And that's difficult because it's an art, not a science, you know, um, there's a lot of room for interpretation, but you don't want to risk something that, you know, you don't want to think like, oh, this is great, but if you're only basing it on one comp, or if the comp is a stretch or like there's just so many things when you're talking about something as specific as historic versus like a cookie cutter neighborhood 
where you know what the neighbor's house sold for and you know you can factor in really easily absolutely yeah i was kind of gonna lead into that as well i mean let's assume that you are investing in that cookie cutter neighborhood um you know how would you how would you su suggest that people run comps or is there a particular way to go about it um yeah so what my mentors who i'm so grateful for have taught me is obviously you're looking at your square footage you're looking at your beds and your bathrooms and you can kind of figure out what to add or take away based on those um, but also look at the neighborhood. So look at like major road to major road and what's inside of there. Don't necessarily go in a big circle around it, which I know is kind of standard, but try to stay within those major intersections and stay within that pocket. And then if you don't have that, um, then extend a little bit out. Cause like some areas, they don't sell very often. And so in that, then you kind of have to extend a little bit and you have to get a little bit more creative. Sure, sure, absolutely. I guess that's kind of the name of the game, just kind of getting creative when, when you really have to be, right? Yeah, it's that balance of like, you need creativity to figure out how you're going to rehab something, um, how you're going to add value, or how you're going to find the right kind of tenants, but you don't want to venture over into such a creative zone that it could be dangerous. Sure, sure, absolutely. You, you touched on another interesting thing too. You mentioned finding the right sort of tenants. You know, how do you, is there a particular way that you advertise or how do you find those people to be able to, uh, you know, get into your properties? So I'm going to say, so I, you know, one of, I know you mentioned um, one of the things that you were interested about with us is multifamily or with me is multifamily. And so um, most of our properties are multifamily, like you alluded to previously, um, or when we were talking before hitting record. And so I'm going to be really honest that we don't manage our own properties at this at this stage of the game. Um, I will say, depending on the property and depending on the property manager, because we do have more than one because they are typically very regionally focused, you know, um, we may or may not be involved in that conversation and in the decision-making process as to whether or not we want a particular tenant. Uh, some cases, like we have some fourplexes, for instance, in Killeen, we're not involved in that at all. Um, that's completely on the property management that they, they they do a pretty good job so far but happy with the tenants that they've brought in the ones that we've inherited have been a bit more challenging um, so they have their own screening process but other than that for our other properties we do use local property management and it is a conversation so obviously they're gonna look for all the standard things they're gonna look for criminal history um, whether or not they make three times the rent um, what their history is on paying their, um, what's the word, landlord, all those kinds of things, down to whether or not they have pets and what kind of pets do they have and all those characteristics. And then we have a conversation and we decide of our applicants, which ones do we think are going to be the best qualified for that particular property? Which ones do we think, in our case, just like most landlords, we want a tenant that's going to be there for a while because turnover is money. Uh, and it's a, it's an expensive process. So we look for tenants that we think are going to enjoy the home and take care of it and are going to want to be there for more than six months or a year. Sure, absolutely. You know, and that's definitely crucial, um, especially for people who are come, investing in other cities, coming from other states, whatever it may be. Um, I'm just kind of interested, you know, given that you live in Austin, you have this um, this property in Colleen. How were you able to find it, or what got you interested in the Colleen market? Uh, that is a good question. So, what got us interested in the Colleen market is the possibility of cash flow. Um, and what I mean by possibility is like you know everything is different in theory than in practice. Um, it's had some expenses that we wouldn't have expected, but it has cash flowed really well. And the reason that that property cash flows well is because it is an outskirts property. So, and I'm sure probably a lot of your listeners are in real estate and they're educated, but you typically trade appreciation for cash flow. So we like outskirts. Um, cash flow is really important to us at this stage of the game. We're looking to increase our incomes. Um, my husband's actually, he's active duty in the army. And so he's leaving that job behind very soon. So replacing his income is something that's, uh, top of mind, if you will. And so we're looking for that versus someone who's doing buy and hold in Austin. They're usually not cash flowing. Um, they're probably cash flow neutral or making 50 bucks a month. 
in most scenarios. And that isn't where we typically want to be. Of course, they're going to gain appreciation, at least that's the assumption. But we like to look at appreciation as like the whipped cream. It's just the really great bonus, but it's not what we bank on. So that sort of brings us to the outskirts, and Colleen is in that category. Cash flows well. Um, you're able to buy things at a really affordable price over there, but you do have some higher risk components and you don't have that high appreciation. Sure, absolutely. You know, I think it's, I'm very interested in Colleen um, because obviously, I mean, I know that we have, you know, the base there, um, but we're having a lot of people that are willing to commute from Colleen into Austin to work. Oh, wow. Yeah, which I, which I yeah. find really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, me too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, that's surprising too. Well, I, I guess it would depend on where in Austin. If it's really north, then that maybe would make sense. Um, that's surprising to me because, like for for example, you have Temple, which is maybe a little bit closer, but it has a really different feel. So it's interesting that someone would want to commute from Colleen. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm always just kind of interested in different secondary markets because. Um, you know, normally the, 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 you know, the metro areas to get attention would be Austin, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, but you know, there's, it kind of seems like there's not very many who talk about Bryan College Station, Colleen Temple area, um, New Braunfels, you know. Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, I remember listening to a mentor or going to like a three-day course and and he said, you know, like, those are the areas where you do fix and flips because they're not going to appreciate. Um, and I get that. I think that those are, there are opportunities for fix and flips there. But there's also a lot of opportunity for cash flow. So, and the great part about those outer lying areas, I mean, all of the ones that you just named, for instance, is that the houses there are so much more affordable. So when you're getting started in real estate and you don't have a lot of money, um, which is probably the case for a lot of people then it's a lot easier to get your foot in the door when you can get a house for less than a hundred grand. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's interesting. You kind of, it's not like you're suggesting it's kind of a rule of thumb, I guess, right? It's either you're kind of almost picking cash flow or the appreciation, like you said, is kind of the whipped cream on top, right? Right. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm really glad that you talked about Colleen. Um, personally, I didn't know that, that you had that property in Colleen. So it's always interesting hearing about other markets. Um, you know, if you don't mind, if would, could you kind of explain maybe your first deal that you did, you know, maybe how you found it, you know, um, you know, any sort of marketing that you used and you know, what, what the end result was. Absolutely. So, um, I will say, and I, I forgot to kind of share this at the beginning, which is kind of an important it's, it's our why. Our why is providing safe, affordable housing. So that also drives us to the outskirts because housing is more affordable there for tenants as well um, and for first-time home buyers and for all those sorts of things. So uh, deal, I kind of shared, you know, I did all the marketing, I tried to find off-market, all that stuff. And that was really frustrating and exhausting and it just didn't really feel like it was getting me um, where I wanted to go. I had an off-market property under contract and we were trying to get title cleared because there was a bunch of liens against it and all of that. And so in my case, I took a loan out from my 401k um, so that I could buy it cash. And so I had borrowed, I took that money out. I'm, again, like a loan, you know, there's no penalties or anything like that, which I think is important because you want to avoid that. You want to keep as much money, as much of your money as you can. Um, so I took that out and set it in the bank and then that deal didn't come through. We weren't able to get those liens removed and it turned into, it was just one of those things where the seller wasn't able to sell it. He would have, he, if I had bought it with those liens attached, he wouldn't have made anything and the liens would still would have been attached. So um, that kind of created this like ticking moment for me because the money was sitting there and inside my brain, I'm like, well, I, I better spend that. So I better figure out a house to buy. Um, and so I started looking, instead of just focusing on my own marketing, I found a deal on MLS. And I know lots of people say that there aren't deals on MLS, but I'll be totally honest and say all of our deals, except for one that we have on a contract right now, have been MLS deals. So they're definitely our deals. In this case, um, I got 
I'll be totally honest. I got an email from a wholesaler. It wasn't one of the, the best wholesalers. And I looked at it and I was like, that's, that's an on-market deal. And I looked it up and they were trying to sell it for a list price on MLS. And I thought, well, like that's dumb. That house needs a lot of work. I'm not going to buy it for a list price, you know? So I just let that sit. I didn't do anything with it. And then of course he wasn't able to sell it because people are smarter than that, uh, in my opinion. So when that house came back on MLS, I reached out to the realtor and I put in an offer and it was a lot lower than the offer that they had had before. And that seller was really hesitant. We had a conversation where the agent said, you know, how are you coming up with your price? Like we have the, the lowest price house in all of central Texas. And I said, well, like that's the amount of money that I have in my bank account. So I get that it's the lowest price house in central Texas, but I only have this much money, take it or leave it. And they took it. Um, and I rehabbed the whole thing, um, foundation, roof. It didn't need electrical or plumbing, thankfully. So I guess I shouldn't say the whole thing, but foundation, roof, paint, flooring, all sorts of other stuff. Um, and that became my first rental. And my first Texas rental, I should say. I had uh, one in California that I'd had for a really long time. Um, and so that just kind of became the catalyst. And then I use, my husband and I prefer the birth strategy. So you buy it, you rehab it, rent it, refinance it. Um, so once it had been seasoned for six months, which I know that there's routes around this now, but I didn't know that then. But once it had been seasoned for six months, I did a cash out refi and pulled out everything that I had put into it and went to go find the next one. It kind of sounds like that's the name of the game and you continue doing that and you know, you kind of build a portfolio. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it's definitely been a solid strategy for us. Um, we like, we got some clarity on like wanting multifamily. Uh, we went up to the fourplexes and at least in Colleen, we don't really love those to be totally honest with you. They have a lot of challenges. Um, so we've kind of identified that we like duplexes because it's almost like a house to the tenants. So you get a better um, quality of tenant, if you will and you're providing them with their own space and their own yard and all those kinds of things. So we really like the duplexes and then currently we're transitioning into a mobile home park. So that's sort of our next venture, but we're still um, looking for small multifamily duplex sort of scenarios. In fact, the one property that we have under contract now, um, it is our very first off market. And I got that through uh, a friend of mine who had got it from her marketing and it didn't fit her criteria. And in this case, it's a, what, it's a single family house, but what got our attention is that it has an ADU and it's like 30 minutes outside of Bryan College Station. So again, middle of nowhere, um, which we, we seem to really like that, you know, that sort of area. <laughs> yeah. And in this case, the, um, the woman that's selling it, you know, she was just in a really tough situation. She needed to move to take care of her mom. And we were, the county over there is really slow, so we're still waiting for title work. Um, so we made the decision because she was sort of held captive by this house and didn't have money to move forward. We made the decision of like giving her a cash deposit essentially so that she could go and get a new place for her family to live and keep her life moving forward while we go through the process of getting the title cleared and all of that, which is obviously it's a risk, you know? Um, but for us, we have a really big why, and that's a way that we could be of service and help her in that transition. So, and for us, it makes sense because it will cash flow really well. Um, it's more than one unit, which is definitely what we like. And it has massive appreciation potential. Um, it's worth, the assessed value is a lot higher than what we're getting it for. And it just makes so much sense on a number side. So it's that great opportunity where you get to combine art and numbers somewhere in the middle. Yeah, you know, it, it is pretty cool that you can do that. I mean, you even just explained it, you know, being able to cash flow and, you know, being able to do everything that's right from a number standpoint for yourself, but also kind of being in alignment with, you know, your why, right? For sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, that was, um, that, that was pretty neat. Um, kind of talking a bit about your first deal. Um, you'd also mentioned something in there uh, about the, about the liens. Um, you know, could you kind of maybe explain, you know, any other sort of challenges someone could get, you know, have with liens, what a lien is, um, and what it means for you in this scenario? So I'm going to put a disclaimer and say I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> 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 so, 
are super complicated. Um, typically, you think about a lien as like someone who has a right to the property. And the most common scenario is you get a mortgage and that mortgage company puts a lien on the property because they have a right to that property before anybody else. Um, in this particular scenario, it was a child support lien. And so we had to go through the attorney general and see um, what options there were in relation to paying that off and how much was owed and just all kinds of questions. And it wound up not making sense for that gentleman to sell the property um, because he wouldn't have benefited and it still wouldn't have taken care of all of those liens and you know taken care of that responsibility. Obviously it's a lower price point home in that scenario. Um, but there are all kinds of liens. There's like liens for judgments, liens for bankruptcy and different court things. And I don't, I'll be honest and say, I do not know all of them by any means. Um, but title companies are like your most important step in that because they do all of the research to figure out what liens there are on the property. And they let you know on your schedule, see what the concerns are. And they have a course of action to get those corrected whenever possible. Yeah, absolutely. Now, wonderful explanation. I, I just thought I would ask because you kind of mentioned how that was, you know, something that was a bit difficult for you to deal with, with that, mm -hmm. with that deal, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that would have been a great one. I think um, the the price point was really affordable and it didn't need that much work. Uh, so that would have been a great property. And But sometimes you have stuff like that and it has to be a win-win for everybody. And in that case, it wasn't. So um, the right thing to do was to uh, to let the seller walk away from the contract. Absolutely. And you, you mentioned something interesting about, you know, talking about duplexes, um, you know, tenants, finding good tenants. But you also mentioned um, mobile homes as well. What kind of made you want to get into mobile homes? Um, that's a great question. So I would say the short answer would be challenging tenants. Um, or maintenance calls because there's like always something broken uh, especially you know the more units that you have the more things break um, I think right now we're we're around 17 units and there's always something and thankfully like we have great property management we could there's no way we could do this on our own um, but there's still always something popping up so the great thing with mobile home parks what got our attention is that typically you own the land and they own the home and they're responsible for maintaining the home um, and then lot rents are typically pretty low so i love that from the affordable perspective so it makes it, it's like when you're thinking about the classes mobile home parks are towards the bottom and it's a great way to provide affordable housing to somebody so whether you are owning it and renting it which of course in that case you have the maintenance to consider um, or you're seller financing it to them or it's just completely their home there's all sorts of options that provide affordable homes to people. And then the other great thing is one of our um, callings or part of our mission statement is community. And so in those, in any sort of multifamily scenario, including mobile home parks, you have an opportunity to create spaces of community and to get your, your neighbors, your tenants in that scenario to get to know each other and to connect with each other. Um, and that's something that we love. It's, it's hard to do on a fourplex level because they're four separate units and you don't really have that space necessarily. Um, but in a park, like you can do pergolas or like barbecue areas or fire pit areas, all those kinds of different things that create a spot for them to gather and get to know each other, which has so many benefits, um, particularly for the tenants, but also for the owners. Yeah, absolutely. It, it We're kind of coming at an interesting time because it seems like more people, whether you're living in, you know, a home in a normal neighborhood, whether you're living out in the country, a mobile park, wherever, it's it almost seems like we're all kind of craving that social cohesion, right? That communal aspect of living. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, that, that is interesting. Um, you also mentioned seller financing as well. Could you kind of break down what seller financing is in, in that context? Absolutely. Um, so in the mobile home context, it would be where I stay as the owner, buy a home, whether I buy it with a mortgage in place or I buy it cash. And then I provide an option for, um, we'll say tenant because it's just easier verbiage for the tenant to buy that home from me. So typically they're going to do a down payment and then they're going to 
um, pay me a certain amount and we're going to have an amortization schedule and all that kind of stuff until they pay off the home, which is a great scenario for someone that maybe struggles to prove um, their income or in particular someone that doesn't have a great credit score. So it provides them an option or a route to home ownership. And of course, we then get the benefit of not having to worry about maintaining the home and they get that sense of pride in home ownership to where hopefully they'll take care of the home. Um, and it's just win win all around. Absolutely. Yeah, you're kind of, uh, you know, you're kind of giving people the tools to be able to, to, to live as they wish and you're providing an awesome service. Yeah, for sure. And people do that on all sorts of levels, whether it be with a home or multifamily or in commercial, it's, you know, there's definitely lots of opportunities where the seller uses seller finance to sell the property because it may or may not be easy to get a mortgage on something of that size. Sure, sure, absolutely. So for you, you know, in the future, I know you kind of mentioned, you know, what you have going on, but what are you, what are you looking forward to in the future? What sort of deals or what do you, what, what's your, your big goal? Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're always looking for um, cash flowing rentals. Um, we look for 20% cash on cash in our deals when we analyze. So basically we're looking for it to beat the stock market by a long run. Um, so we look at like how much is each unit going to cash flow and based upon how much money we're getting, we're putting into it, what's that rate of return over the year? Um, so that's sort of our metrics. We're definitely getting more into the mobile home park community. So we're constantly looking for more parks that are for sale, um, and trying to figure out how we can provide value in those arenas, if you will. And I would say at this point in time, we are, we know enough to where we're bringing in partners. And we also, we recognize that, you know, a few of us working together can take down and provide more um, at a faster speed than us just working alone. So we're looking for partners, whether it be on um, a fix and flip sort of rehab for a rental, which is something that we just did. You, know, you may have seen that I shared on Facebook, like we redid the whole inside of our most recent duplex and replacing tenants now. Um, and so we're looking for partners for those sort of small deals, which are great because you can get into real estate at a really affordable price. Um, and then we're also looking for partners on our bigger deals. Like right now we have a mobile home park that we're, that's under contract and it'll be over 30 units. And we pulled together funds with three other very experienced investors. And obviously that's at a different um, price point, but basically we're looking for partners who are, wanting to work with people who have some idea of what they're doing, you know, um, and we're looking for opportunities that support that. So if you have an ugly duplex next to you and the owner wants to sell, you know, give them my number. <laughs> That's right. Anyone watching with an ugly duplex, <laughs> let Shrada know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. All right, Shrada. Well, is there anything else that, you know, you haven't said that you'd really just like to hit home? Um, no, I think that's everything in a nutshell for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, wh where else can we, I, I know you mentioned, you know, if you have an ugly duplex, give you a call. I would be happy to put your information in the description. Where can we find you? Uh, so I'm on Facebook under Shrada Jenkins and I'm on Instagram under Shrada J. Um, so you can look me up on either of those platforms and I would love to connect and um, help anybody in any way I can. Okay, absolutely, Shrada. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I really enjoyed that. I, I got a lot, a lot out of it. Um, you had a real fresh perspective on, you know, a lot of different facets of real estate. So that was that was excellent. Well, great. I'm glad to. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be a guest. Okay. Thanks a lot, Shrada. Have a good one. Take care.